the last minute notice. Uh, I'd like to thank Microsoft for sponsoring the venue and coming on the last minute notice because I only announced Sunday night. Uh, and last but not least, uh, well, thanks for Traveloka to come to speak today. We have Deb, who is a data science lead in Traveloka, focusing on FES, <laughs> uh, which is natural language, computer vision, and speech. And then we have Yixuan, who is working on recommended system. So without further ado, please give a round of applause for them. Hi, can you hear me at the back or? All right, cool. Okay, so we don't need the mic, that's, that's great. Um, I, I usually start this off by asking people if they've heard of Traveloka before. And that's probably a moot question given that this has been blasted on the wall for about half an hour now. But in general, have, how many in the audience have? I think we the mic. Yeah? Okay, fine. Well, we'll Thank you. To use the mic, we must find the mic. Okay, here we go. Is that? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah, yeah? All right, okay, cool. So, I'll repeat the question. How many of you have heard of Traveloka as a company before? Oh, wow, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so, so people from Traveloka, please put your hands down. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so who, I, I thought in that case, I mean, it's, it's always useful to do a bit of an overview about who we are, because we don't really advertise as much in this part of Southeast Asia. Uh, interestingly enough, we are actually a leading uh, online travel company in the region. Um, you may have heard of us, uh, but you may not know to what extent we do operate in the region. Um, we're actually, I mean, most of you probably associate, those of you who have heard of us, probably associate us with flights and hotels, uh, but we actually do a lot more. Um, actually, this is probably a not comprehensive portfolio. In fact, our FinTech colleagues at the back will probably say, hey, where are we? Um, but this is kind of what we do. Uh, we have about 100 plus airline partners, quite a few hotels in over 100 countries. Uh, from, from a data perspective, what might interest you and certainly does to us is we have about a million daily users and at least 40 million apps that the new that pack now. 40 million times that people have downloaded our app uh, in the region. Uh, this is where we operate. Uh, in terms of offices, uh, so the only exception to office versus uh, operations is India. So we only have a research presence in India. So we don't actually <coughs> offer our platform or app as a service. So Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, and recently Australia. Okay, so that's that's you know uh, corporate HR did ask me to just make sure you say good things about travel workers. So so we love working there, and that's certainly. Job down that front. So let's talk a little bit about machine learning and travel work. Okay. So uh, I, I, before we get there, I thought I'd just introduce how we're structured. So naturally, you can think of us as you know comprised of a central business units. So our products are owned by business units. So for example, flights and hotels. These are products. So they're owned by EU. Um, we have central engineering teams who back these up. Uh, we've got corporate functions, so HR, <coughs> etc. Uh, and then we have the data team. And the data team, um, what we want to do is enable the company to make better decisions faster, uh, generate actionable insight, uh, create and nurture a culture of data-driven decision-making, and essentially create long-term capabilities and expertise to drive value for the business. Now, uh, I hope, you know, for some of you who are noticing uh, that we don't have goals like building the data lake or making an AI team. It's probably not a good vision and mission to have. I think doing it for the sake of doing it is probably a foolhardy endeavor. So we're focused on basically enabling business impact. Um, and what we do own to get there is things like the data lake, our core data platform, which makes sure that any machine learning models that we do deploy to production uh, have the features they need in real time. Uh, we've got our analytics teams. And we have AI and ML. I think um, I, I try not to use the word AI as much as I can. <laughs> Um, I, think, I think we have a running joke uh, that uh, if, you're, if you're writing code, it's machine learning. If you're in a PowerPoint, it's AI. So well, I guess, okay. And of course, we have A-B testing, which is quite a critical component in, in pretty much any machine learning uh, endeavor. In fact, any, every company does and should have A-B testing. Okay, so within the data team, we spoke about machine learning. Uh, at Traveloka, we try and segment them into two very big, but you know, broad buckets. Uh, we think of them as machine learning for humans and machine learning for machines. 
So M of humans is where we kind of generate our insights. We have a lot of models. So for example, complex metrics, we use statistical measures to come up with those and make sure that they're valuable to the business. But this is also where we house our experiments uh, unit, um, as well as our data markets. Machine learning for machines is where we uh, think of them as data or machine learning products. Right? So, so you've got insights and you've got um, models, but there are also certain components of the platform which we want to automate or augment. Uh, and that's where we leverage machine learning to really get them to the next level. Uh, we also do R&D. Uh, I should say that um, when it comes to R&D at Traveloka, we're very explicit. We're not a blue sky research organization. I think uh, we're not at a stage where we feel that that's truly valuable uh, for us. But we're certainly keen to innovate. Uh, and so we certainly do a lot of R&D uh, in alignment with what the business needs us to do. OK, so that's us, uh, some of us. Some of us. Um, I do apologize to the women in, in the room. I'm, I'm so sorry for such a monochromatic, uh, non-diverse picture. Uh, yeah, we definitely have some wonderful female data scientists and analysts at Traveloka. This is just some of us, so you may see Ishwan here as well, who's kind of with us. So this is a couple of our teams. So the NBS team, which is NLP Vision and Speech, and our recommendation systems team, just before we're off doing some AI, right? OK, so uh, the theme of the talk. Um, is NLP at Traveloka and how we have to work with uh, a non-English environment. So uh, what do we use NLP at Traveloka for? Where, where do we use it? So you've, you've got the traditional, you've got um, chatbots. That's supposed to represent a chatbot, by the way. So uh, yeah, it's a little good. Um, so essentially, yes, we've got sort of chat technologies and they're yeah, you should sure go to man that right now, sorry. Uh, but uh, we have a review moderation. So, so if you think of the platform and how people engage with us, um, we've got a pretty active uh, community. And they're very vocal about their feedback and how they want to express their disapproval or approval uh, of the places they stay at on our platform. Now, at the same time, we need to make it a sane and safe place for everyone to engage with. So review moderation comes into play. and. In terms of the loads that we get, uh, if we needed to do it completely manually, uh, it would cost us a lot of money uh, uh, to maintain that same level of quality of customer service. So this is where we do leverage machine learning and AI to help ease that. Um, customer support. So, so one of the core uh, values that Traveloka really tries to espouse is top-notch you know, customer service. So when people engage with our platform, we try and make sure we're delivering the best experience we can to them. And that's why customer support is very important to us. At the same time, we need to make sure it's scalable to do. So we do use that. Uh, search, so if any of you ever, I probably will need to go into too much detail into what search is. I think we're all, I think we're pretty much a place with search with Google these days. Can I say that? Knowledge engineering. So here, basically, we're trying to understand the relationship between entities or things. Um, and it's certainly a component of understanding how language plays a part in there, right? Now, um, okay, so th that's how we use NLP at, you know, at Loka. Uh, the other thing that kind of goes unsaid is Indonesia is our biggest market, and Bahasa is a language that is spoken throughout this region. It's very popular. So, so what, what's what's the challenge, right? What's what's going on? I mean, why is NLP in a non-English environment uh, a factor? So it's, it's interesting because this, this leads back a little bit to how so machine learning has evolved and transformed over the last 20, 30 years. And most of you, um, not all, but, but most of you probably encountered machine learning you know, after this whole deep learning hype cycle. Uh, interestingly enough, the technology that powers deep learning at its core is this quite it's ancient, but it's certainly been around for 20, 30 years. Uh, what actually happened there is computing power and data caught up. And that really caused an explosion. Some practitioners were able to make significant gains and leverage the hardware and data at our disposal to make that huge jump. And that's kind of caused this huge hype cycle. Uh, what's kind of gone under the radar is a lot of the ancillary domains. So initially, it was all in the vision space. Uh, but uh, domains like natural language processing actually relied on a lot of, um, I wouldn't say artistic endeavor, but uh, certainly a lot of scientific research to power the core fundamental components. So you're talking about things like parts of speech tagging, you know, 
So dependency parsing, where you're saying, well, this is a sentence, and how do you understand what these parts of speech that comprise the sentence, what's a noun, what's a verb, things like that. You're looking at named entity recognition, where you're saying, okay, so how do you understand that from this particular sentence, this means a person, this is a place, an organization, and so on and so forth. Word embeddings. So word embeddings are obviously, I think, from my personal perspective, one of the most interesting things that have come out of this deep learning revolution that they're probably going to be around for, for much longer than RNNs or SCFs, uh, hopefully. But uh, of course, when it comes to non-English word embeddings, they're not as um, useful or as vigorously trained, uh, at least in our experience. And that's probably a function of the fact that labeled data sets or data sets for research in, in, in OP non-English languages are not as available. It's certainly for Southeast Asian languages. I mean, apart from huge exceptions like China, China, Mandarin, Japanese, um, and certainly some of the European languages. Uh, but in general, for Bahasa, we don't find you know, as much data. So, so we're missing the key ingredient here, right? I mean, if you think back to what's really powered this hype cycle, and this, this AI cycle, if you will, uh, machine learning, live, and it's data, and we're kind of missing that ingredient. So the other thing, of course, as a function of that is baseline data sets. So you do some work, you do some research, you come up with some numbers, and you're like, I don't actually know if uh, how good we are because there is no agreed upon set baseline which says, okay, if you get a 40% complexity for your specific data set for your language model, you did well or, or not, right? So that's difficult to understand. So you've done some work, but you don't always know how good it is until you're, you know, actually testing it out in real life. And this is kind of where travel look has a bit of an edge uh, because we do have a lot of data. So I kind of look, like to think of, uh, sort of the deep learning era and um, uh, the components that you really need to get high quality NLP in three buckets. Again, uh, this is meant to be a bit of a uh, over, you know, it's, it's generous, so, so it's not highly accurate, but essentially, if you get your pre-processing right for your specific language, if you've got a good set of word vector embeddings, and if you are comfortable implementing and tuning your chosen deep learning architectural framework, I think you're in good hands. That's a good starting point for you to think about getting productive results in your chosen language. Uh, is this going to stream? <laughs> so, uh, is that better? Is that, is that better? No. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Right, let's, let's move on then. Um, uh, how many of you know what language models are? Okay, so all of you, that, that just, so I'll, I'll skip this now. Okay, so language models basically um, are a really simple to understand concept. What they're saying is, um, if you're given a specific sequence of words, uh, if it's an n-gram, uh, basically you're saying, given a sequence of words, try and predict the most likely next word. Right, so my name is, and depending on the corpus that you're playing on, it might be John, if it's, if it's in an English corpus, right? So that's what a language model is. Uh, ULM fit is, is a pretty nifty piece of research done by Sir Jeremy Howard and Sachi Ruder, and they're kind of trying to say, well, a language model has these core components. We found a framework where you can train and tune your language model in three ways. So what they say is you train your core vector embedding on a pretty general corpus. Right? You're saying just train it on your Wikipedia's and your news article data sets. Uh, then what you should do is basically fine tune it on your chosen task uh, language corpus. So if you're customizing your specific language model to cater to customer support in the travel industry, this is probably a good time to introduce that corpus of data. And then you finally try and do a last stage, which is basically fine tune the classification component. Now, uh, okay, let me just move on. Uh, because because I, I didn't want to make, I wasn't sure what the audience composition was going to be, so I didn't want to make it too technical. Uh, and at the same time, I do feel that these talks sometimes, um, if you're really interested, there are some phenomenal res, you know, resources which help you understand these things. What I was hoping to talk about is about more challenges which you may not have access to in wider literature. So if some of these terms are a bit confusing, or if you're not as aware of these, uh, I would heartily recommend uh, reading up on these resources. Uh, will give you much more clarity than hearing me talk about it in the next five minutes. But broadly speaking, so AWD LSTM is, is a way within um, 
So, so LSTMs are basically long short term memories, and they're basically a specific form of deep learning uh, neurons slash architecture which helps you handle sequences. Uh, this particular framework helps you tune that, uh, and this is a one of the secret sources which is part of your LM fit. Right? So the, the big takeaway from here is that this algo helps you train your language model better and faster uh, so that you actually reach convergence. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about the data, the experiments that we conducted and some of the results that we obtained. Um, so, so this is kind of what we used. Right, so we, we had some Wikipedia data uh, in Indonesian. We, we crawled it out, we got it. It's, it's, it's a pretty set pattern. Uh, it's a pretty ready to use workflow. Uh, you can get most of this information. What we did internally is essentially the data scientists within the team went out, spoke to all our business stakeholders and says, give me every single piece of text that we've ever had. Right, I have trouble with it. It was a hunt, it was a treasure hunt, but it was, it was absolutely something which wasn't really out there. So we had to go out, speak to our PMs, go dig deep into our repositories of which there are many, go and dig deep into our data buckets of which there are many, because when you're around for seven years, you kind of change things, so GCSS, a whole, whole, whole shebang, right? So we ended up with this data set, right? six million sentences, uh, 99 million uh, sort of tokens, or words, uh, and, uh, no? Okay. I need to speak into I need to speak into the mic. Okay. Okay. I, I don't know, is which, like, mic is better? Okay. Good one. <laughs> All right, so, um, okay, I, I will try and remember this. Uh, so, so what I do want to sort of reflect here is how messy real data is compared to uh, the Wikipedia corpus. Um, so, so I want you to kind of bring your eyes to this particular number and, and this, what this F equals you know, within the five means. Um, what this means is, in terms of unique words that were in our corpus, uh, that occurred at least five times or more. Uh, this number goes up to 1.9 million when we take all of them. So what actually comprises this data set is things like chat logs, reviews, help requests. Right? So people having an email saying, ah, I need a refund, or, or you know, I love travel logger. So they're passionate whenever they're having some of these you know, pieces of text, which means they misspell so. So it's I guess the message I would say is it's very important to kind of keep handle on how messy real life data can be. I also want to kind of highlight your the, the things in red. Uh, I, I, I'd love it if somebody could tell me uh, a word that's about 118 characters long. Uh, I, I think I have a pretty decent vocabulary, but I'd love to learn more. Likewise, this guy, like, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> oh, girl. So, so certainly it's something which you have to spend a lot of time managing around. Uh, if I had to quantify the amount of time we spent on doing this work, uh, hands down, most of it was in getting to this part here, okay? Okay, so then what did we do? We wanted to understand how to use, or how to build a language model which would help us uh, really take our NLP offerings in Bahasa to the next level. To do that, we chose ULM Fit, and the decisions for this are not purely technical. I think they're a bit, I, you know, uh, the data scientists who are working on this, they love PyTorch, they've been using it. ULM Fit was something they just wanted to try out. We could have gone with Elmo or Bert, which are, again, operating in the similar space. We chose ULM Fit. And we did this. So basically we said, let's, let's have a look and let's make sure that we're trying both things. So let's validate. I think there's certainly um, a crisis of reproducible research going on in the community. So wherever possible, it's always a good idea to make sure that you're trying to replicate results. Okay. So what we said is, let, let's, let's, you know, let's get a pre-trained word embedding off the shelf and then use that as a starting point. But that's always a good idea, uh, except when it isn't. Uh, and then we said, Let, let's try to also train our own embeddings from scratch. I think we've got enough data, why not give it a shot, right? So we did that, and then we said, let's see the impact of accounting for aberrations in our data and, and not. And we felt uh, the arbitrary, the nice even numbers, it's all about even numbers, but the nice even splits, so say frequency of five and 10, and say, let's take these corpora, 
And then we basically split our final validation set into three. These had, these had all the messy in, in them, right? So they had no filters, no frequency filters at all. So we, we, were, we ran these experiments. And these are our results. Uh, okay, so this is, um, we were quite excited when we saw this. Because the numbers that you're seeing on the number, the column you need to pay attention to is the perp, which does not stand for perpetrator, but uh, perplexity. Uh, and that's basically a measure that we often use to measure the performance of language models. Uh, at a high level, perplexity tries to answer the question, uh, to relates to information entropy, and it says what's the probability that the output of the language model has actually covered some meaningful aspect of your overall linguistic vocabulary, right? So essentially, low numbers are good, high numbers are bad, okay? Um, this is where things get very interesting. So for the keen-eyed among you, okay, so let me briefly describe the structure. So we've got the Traveloka Corpus results over there. We've got the Wikipedia Indonesian results over here, and ignore this for now. I'll come to it later. What we did, if you look on the column there, is we also have it categorized by our pre-trained and our own vocabulary, uh, sorry, word embedding, and we also have it done by sort of the minimum FF5 or an FF10, as well as on each validation set. Right? So. What you see is our lowest you know, perplexity is about 14.01. If you then compare the perplexity of the models in the Wikipedia data set, it's, it's a significant aberration. Uh, I can tell you right now, uh, for most of you who are asking, yes, it's, it's probably worth it, right? Um, but here's the, here's the weird one, right? The sort of perplexity numbers for still the uh, English performance is around 40, uh, last that I checked, four. Wikipedia corpora, right? So the fact that we're getting a sort of a 14% number is really, it's intriguing because you're like, okay, well, you're overfit. At the same time, it's, it's, it's wow, it's, it's a lot higher than what we're expecting, so what can we do with it? No. So to test that out, we kind of went down this whole character and identity approach, where basically instead of training word embeddings, we train character embeddings. So the biggest difference there to think of it is, if you think of an embedding or, or a vector embedding in, in the word space as a word is represented by a number in the character level space, you're basically taking into account that a vector embedding of a word is comprised of the individual vector representations of the characters. So it's much more robust to spellings or out of vocabulary aberrations, right? So here we did see a bit of a bit of a bump. So this is very interesting because the scientist in, in us was screaming, ah, overfit, let's not do it. But we, we said, you know, we have what we have. We'll spend some time on it. Let's actually test it out in a real world use case. Uh, we did train it on a very interesting email classification task. And we kind of beat uh, some of the top vendors in the space. So our results are heads down, hands down, superior by about 7 to 8% for people who we've engaged professionally to do the exact same task. So I guess that's another challenge. So whenever you're doing production machine learning, um, try and see if it actually solves your problem before making the final decision. It's often not easy. There are certainly areas where you say, no, 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 this definitely hits all the red flags. And at the same time, there are certainly times where you say, okay, well, I, I can live with this compromise. So I wanna, I wanna kind of not take too much of your time because uh, this is actually some of the interesting stuff that I was hoping to get to. Um, so, managing inference latency. Yes? Uh, can you go back to the last thing? Sure. So Sorry, do, do you mind if we, I, 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 will, I will definitely answer, do you mind if we just finish, okay. just in case, um, okay. Uh, okay, so, um, managing inference latency. Uh, when it comes to machine learning and production, the biggest sort of jump that a lot of people I find struggle to make is you've trained the model, you've got your notebook, and it's wonderful, it's beautiful, uh, but now we need to productionize it. So you don't really think about performance when you're doing a lot of the research, but when you type in a search query, uh, there's a lot of research, and it's true, that basically the latency at which you can return a result has a direct impact on sort of customer satisfaction with that data product. So to give you an example, for our search platforms, in terms of our intent detection SLAs, uh, we, we operate on sort of the 100 millisecond threshold, right? So when somebody says, this is a query, and I need to understand 
what this query particularly means or what product it's referring to, we have to give that result back in 100 milliseconds. Now, deep learning is notorious for really taking a lot of resources out there, right? So uh, we use using PyTorch, so this is something a bit specific to PyTorch, uh, but essentially what we found is trying just-in-time comp compilation, which came as part of the 1.0 release, has a benefit. So there's certainly uh, an avenue of thought. I mean, you can always, so you've done a lot of benchmarks and you're saying you want to put in, chug in a 24 core CPU instance, deploy your Kube container over there, uh, and that gives you a certain latency, or you could do it on the GPU on the cloud if you're doing it on cloud. Um, but there's certainly a trade-off to be made, right? Because one of them costs a lot more than the other. So if you need to do low latency inference in the deep learning space, it's, it's critical to optimize for. Uh, and that's often not something which is you know, widely covered in the literature. So, so GIT compilation basically takes your Python code and you know, compiles it into C++ as you're sort of serving the model out there at very high level speed. You know. uh, and this is kind of some of the impact, uh, some of the um, numbers that we got. So for on, on our MacBook, uh, we were seeing a huge, you know, huge difference. So uh, we're seeing a significant gain in terms of the latency for our model serving. Um, and on a, on a GPU server, it's not as profound, but I would say that given that you know, in any case, most of your GPU interfaces are already pre-compiled in C++, so it's really the final wrapper code which you can <coughs> compile. It, it's not that surprising. Um, the, the other thing which uh, is pretty new, it's highly experimental, but it's something which I think you, sh you know, people should start talking about a lot more is the sort of pruning. Um, so the pruning, uh, essentially, if you kind of look at most uh, deep learning models, after they've been trained, they're still quite sparse. Uh, and what that means is if it's sparse, then the chances are that a particular neuron or a particular layer or a particular section isn't really contributing as much to the decision for your particular case of data set as it could be. In which case, why not drop it? Right, so think of it like sort of compressing your deep learning train model. There are various uh, approaches to do it. Uh, we were using PyTorch, which is why I didn't, we didn't go with the Google implementation, but Intel and Nirvana have kind of um, gone, they've developed Distiller and they had a pretty interesting code base. So that's kind of another thing, right? So when you're doing some of these machine learning in production, you're often constrained by time resources. So you say, well, I don't have six months to do this, so I can't really build or write this paper from scratch. Is there a tool out there that I can really grab and, and work with? So what we did, and I, the reason, again, I'm being highly experimental here is because we've tried it out. It's worked for us in a very specific use case and I just wanted to give people a taste for some of the avenues that we have to chase, chasing performance. So we managed to get, a, I think, a 30% uh, for our best trade off I think we got a 30% reduction in our model memory size, and that resulted in a sort of 2.3% drop in performance. Um, inference time was more or less static. Okay, so. Um, the, the other challenge when it comes to uh, productionizing machine learning is you have to think about model scaleness. Uh, oftentimes, in, in fast-moving tech companies, you release products uh, which are quite new, not just to your company but conceptually. Right. So sometimes you don't actually have data on how people are going to use your product. Uh, in which case, what becomes really important is your uh, pre-production model performed at a certain metric. Like, ah, I'm really happy with the position of it. It's, it's beautiful. It's fantastic. And then you launch it, and people are using it in, in very different ways. I mean. We've seen people put in math equations in our platform. And you're like, why would you do that? But they do it. And then you're like, okay, well, and, and the PMs are screaming, ah, customer satisfaction. So anyway, so, so some things like that happen. And you have to account for it. The message is figure out a way, once you've deployed a specific product, to be able to loop back and iterate very quickly. Uh, what we're trying to do at Traveloka is basically adopt a bit of a reusable research paradigm. And we, we think there are four things that you need for every machine learning model in order to be able to draw a line back and repeat and iterate. The data, so what's your training data? What's your validation set? Uh, either snapshot it, or if you're comfortable, if you think your data stack allows for it to be repeatedly sampled, then store the query, but store it somewhere. The second piece is the model itself. Here, we recommend doing both uh, your source code, naturally, and of course, the artifact as well. Because sometimes there's often a dis discrepancy between ah, you've got the record, you've got the data, you've trained it, but somehow when you store it in, in, in whatever 
storage of your choice, and then you, you put it in your Docker container, it got corrupted, and, and you want to make sure you're isolating issues like that. So store both. The third thing is hyperparameters. So obviously, when you have training machine learning models, uh, especially in the deep learning space, they're so sensitive to uh, hyperparameters. Uh, in fact, so even things like seed set seeds are, have, have been shown to have a significant impact on your loss and conversion. So store those as well. And finally, you've got, okay, so you, you've kind of got your data, you've got your model, and you've got your hyperparameters, but do you know what result that actually got you, right? So make sure you're versioning that as well. So, so these are the paradigms that we're trying to adopt. Uh, it's, it's a really tough problem, by the way, so if anyone has any solutions, uh, please come and speak to me. Uh, but we're trying to get there, and I think, um, I think in the interest of time, I will skim through this. This is the other thing. When it comes to training, uh, we got lucky, uh, but it kind of took us sort of 10 days uh, for our Traveloka corpus out of the 100 uh, GPU uh, machine and six days for Wikipedia corpus. This could have easily taken a few weeks. Uh, in fact, for some of our early iterations, when we were trying things out, it was just constantly training for a week. So then, when you're thinking about how do you get a training pipeline for something which is slow moving yet needs to be deployed very quickly, or has a sort of a, it's got a dichotomy there, right? It takes a long time to train, but uh, the data that's powering your algorithm and the conditions under which your algorithm is successful change quite quickly. So it's important to kind of go with a pretty, so invest in effort. So don't underestimate the amount of effort and time it will take you to go from a notebook to a full blown streamlined uh, feedback. Right? Um, Okay, so um, again, some of the key takeaways, some of these are not directly, uh, you know, think about the form of the inference. So these are one of the challenges which, which will hit you whenever you're coming up with an algorithm. Uh, don't optimize prematurely. So hands up, we've done absolutely no hyperparameter tuning for our AWD LSTM work. We've just taken the ones that were on the paper and the repo, but we haven't had to so far. If we need to, we'll get there. I just feel that it's something which you should do if you genuinely feel it adds value or if it's not solving your problem, right? Finally, I think, I think this is an adage which, which people underestimate. Uh, it's also something which actually people take a lot, like, lot more likely when it comes to working with image or, or NLP data. Or somehow just because you don't have the classic EDA life cycle in a more sort of you know, quantitative or uh, feature specific machine learning life cycles and think, now you don't really check your data. Well, yeah, guess what? I mean, it was a learning process, but uh, the first iteration, which took a few months, was because you know, uh, the gentleman who was doing the experiments didn't check for frequency, so uh, <laughs> to do it, right? So I guess that's that's really my key takeaway. Uh, these are the three big key, key takeaways. I hope you enjoy the talk. I'd be more than happy to take any questions. So. Back to that slide. So please introduce yourself, where you are from, and your question. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Manu from Gojek. I'm a data scientist at Gojek. Uh, so my question is, uh, can you name the pre-trained word embedding which you tried? And the second question is, did you actually try uh, like training the pre-trained word embeddings on your corpus, Traveloka. Yeah. So just yes. Yeah, so uh, that's a pretty good question. Um, so essentially, what we did is we took the uh, we're using word as our word embedding space, right? So we literally took the word embeddings that were off the shelf for Bahasa from their official repo. Uh, and, and when I say kind of pre-trained versus not pre-trained, so. Just to clarify, uh, we took the pre. Uh, so the biggest difference here in the experiment protocol is we start. We either started with those pre-trained embeddings, or we went completely vanilla and we said, "Let's start from scratch. Let's rebuild our own virtual vec on, on our Wikipedia." Which one performed better? Like when you trained on pre. -trained? So 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 here, what we're saying is, um, when we didn't use pre-trained. To perform better. So, false here means basically we. So this is basically the fact that we did use the word of Here we didn't, and 
this specifically, well, we, when we sanitize it a little bit for frequency of words, this is what we found best for us. And in case of corrected uh, uh, did you use like CNNs or LSTMs? No, sorry. So this is uh, so this is uh, uh, capture level embedding. So not RNNs or LSTMs. We will take one more question and we will leave the rest after you should have speak. In the interest of time. Please introduce who you are. Hi, I'm Raymond. Um, okay, yeah. So um, my my question is that I I don't I don't. Oh, hello. Is that very? Uh, you can I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my my question is that uh, why do you actually need a real time uh, prediction uh, for? I I'm getting that basically this is a you're generating a word embedding, right? You can always uh, pre make inferences of, uh, for the result and then basically just put it in a top table. <coughs> because it's just what embed is, right, at the moment. Yeah. Um, so so not, not quite. I mean, basically the way we kind of use this infrastructure is we then plug in a classifier on the end of this entire pipeline. So the word embeddings then go through the language model followed by a final classifier. So that's where the inefficiencies come, inefficiencies come into play. Uh, so for example, we a more, maybe perhaps, so we use uh, intent detection and search as a use case, but if you're thinking about uh, natural language generation, right? So here's a query, you understand what it is, but now you want to respond. When it comes to that kind of space, then <coughs> latency becomes critical. Um, I mean, sure, you can always try and fudge it by trying to simulate, oh, robots thinking, and then, but, but it's better to err on the side of when you really need to respond. Uh, Can I just ask one more? Sure, sure, go for it. Sorry. Okay, uh, so, so in that case, um, because in Indonesia, the, the GPUs are not generally available for most cloud platforms, and I, I guess that network latency is one of the major issues. How are you getting around that? Um, so that's an interesting one, right? Because when it comes to the stack that we've invested in, um, uh, obviously AWS, GCP, uh, kind of, they do operate in Singapore. Uh, so when it comes to handling GPU inferences, it's important to make sure that you're uh, well, I mean, that, that's how we're getting around it, right? So we, we don't really have any GPUs in, in Indonesia or the Indonesian cluster, so we have to work with the organizations we have. So that's why it becomes, so I guess we kind of think of this is the pie that you have to play with from the customer perspective. And then certain components keep taking chunks off it, and then finally at the end, maybe the machine learning team has like, yeah, this much to play with. And we talk for that. But uh, yeah, I guess the answer is there's no easy solutions, uh, but we try our best. Of data. 
So this is the agenda I have for today. Uh, first of all, why do we want to do recommendations, for our recommendations? And then I'll cover some use cases of what recommendations can do. Next I'll give a simplified overview of what architecture is required to serve recommendations. And then I'll be covering uh, one recommendation algorithm, which is called the Smart Adaptive Recommendations. It, inside it actually involves two models, which is a similarity model as well as the affinity model. And I'll explain how they uh, put together to derive personalized recommendations. And finally, I will cover some implementation, implementation details before, before I come conclude. So why do we want to do recommendations? Um, so the primary reason why we want to do recommendation is that recommendation actually uh, assists in product discovery as well as decision making. Uh, in most internet companies, um, we have observation that looks like this, but we have a lot of products. But then actually the proper popular products form a very small, um, take out a small proportion of your product catalog. And there's a very, very long tail of um, products that are relatively less popular. This is also uh, known as a Pareto principle. So there's a important few uh, followed by a trivial many. So um, recommendations actually help to discover help discovery of these products uh, in the tail end uh, because uh, these products are niche. Uh, they probably only fulfill the needs for for a selected few uh, customers, and recommendations actually help to display these products. Uh, into the customer's uh, app or website. So another reason recommendation is useful is that, um, especially if recommendations are personalized, it promotes customer satisfaction. Uh, this is especially so when the products that are recommended are relevant to uh, the product and so the user. And having real-time personalization actually further encourages user interaction because if they can see uh, recommendations reacting to their browsing or their usage of the app, then they are encouraged to use the app more to see what the recommendations can be shown. So use cases of recommendations, there are many use cases. I'll be covering two that um, my, the model, the algorithm that I'll be covering actually touches on. So first of all is the item similarity recommendations. Uh, these recommendations are usually shown in the product details page of your of your application. Uh. So this is what it looks like in Amazon. So for example, if I'm browsing for a textbook for on social network analysis, um, the recommendation shows me other textbooks that are covering the same topic. Uh. So the purpose of this is to show the users that what other alternatives you can consider uh, given that look at this this particular item. So the next kind of recommendation is personalized recommendations. Um, this is from Netflix. Uh, this kind of recommendations usually appear in the whole page or certain landing pages. And um, recommendations like these are usually based on user, uh, influence on users' preferences. And it has the purpose of showing users what they may like, even though uh, they may not be looking for it yet. So next, um, I'll be covering, giving a sim simple overview of what most recommended, recommended systems actually uh, require. So this is a very, very simplified overview. It usually consists of um, three steps uh, to derive, so from four, to get four different components. Uh. So first of all, we start with the user interactions or the data of the users using our website. From there, uh, we select other candidates uh, to narrow down your catalog. This is important, especially if you have a large catalog of data, sorry, of items, and then you come to product scoring for all the items uh, in the specific amount of time. So doing subset of the product catalog is very important in this step. So after we have the item candidates, uh, we will go to the next step, which is doing scoring of the items. Uh, then we derive a rank list, of, rank list of items. And then from that rank list, we take the top K 
and then we did display to the user. So I, on these various steps, there are various models that can be used um, uh, separately. Uh. So for candidate selection, uh, most of it is actually doing some form of user inference, uh, doing segmentation, or inferring user's preferences on maybe their activities, uh, their spending power, um, their brand, brand preferences, and then from there we can select candidates based on that. And then with scoring items, um, uh, obvious use case, uh, so obvious model is doing um, some relevance modeling prediction and scoring. So I'll be covering one, uh, uh, just one algorithm. Uh, it's called the Smart Adaptive Recommendations Algorithm. Uh, actually, I've been doing this also in the Zara and right now in Traveloka. The concept behind it is quite simple. Uh, I didn't actually think there would be a name for it, but I saw this in a Microsoft web website. So <laughs> I don't think they claim to invent it, but they name it, so I'm just going to use this name. <coughs> so this is the overview of the model architecture. Um, it's very straightforward, very simple. We only start with one data that's required, which is the transaction data. This is actually the user browsing data. Um, only four fields from the user browsing data is required. The user ID, the item ID, the time of uh, the interaction, as well as the event type. So the event type will be something like uh, page views, add to cart, uh, check out, and then purchase. So from there, we derive two separate models. <coughs> First of all, with the item similar, we uh, the item similarity matrix, and after that, also getting the affinity matrix. Then after we combine these two models together, and then we get a list of scores, and then we take the top k items. Uh. So don't worry about the picture. I will be showing this uh, repeatedly in the next few slides. Uh. So the characteristic of this model, uh, so of this algorithm is that it's actually quite straightforward. It's only based on two concepts, uh, item similarity as well as uh, recency to similar items. Uh, in terms of the type of recommendation of model it is, this is a uh, model that's based on collaborative filtering or implicit feedback. Uh. So co collaborative filtering means that it's based on um, user's interaction as opposed to content-based filtering, which is based on uh, the item attributes or the user attributes. And then implicit feedback means that um, we're not asking users explicitly to grade items, but rather we are inferring their preferences based on how often they look at certain items. Uh, this algorithm is able to serve uh, real-time personalization. Uh, I'll, be able, I'll show you how it, it works later. And also the benefit of this algorithm is that it works on new users as long as they have at least one click, one direction on the website. Uh, unfortunately, this does not work on yeah, the cost problem or for new items. Uh, but actually, this is not a major problem uh, if, because given that um, personalized recommendation, we have a limited real estate, so we do not have the luxury of providing scores for all the items anyway. So we probably can show up to 10 items, 20 items, and most we will not be able, we don't have to score all the items. Uh. And then finally, this model is able, this algorithm is able to serve uh, both recommendation use cases I mentioned earlier. So I'll touch on each of the models separately. So starting with the similarity model, um, which is actually at this part of the model, model architecture. So how do we get the similarity model? Um, from the transaction data, we, the first thing we need to do is actually to construct this uh, item called occurrence matrix. Uh, uh, you can also think of this as some form of market basket analysis. We are trying to find uh, for two, a pair of items, why is the, uh, the number of times they actually appear together. Uh, you can count um, based on check out uh, number of cards that two items appear together. Or in, in my case, I actually count the number of times, number of distinct users uh, that has interacted with both item I and item J 
within a predefined period, uh, for example, uh, one week. So this matrix is actually a square matrix uh, where each dimension corresponds to the um, to every item in the catalog. And then the x, the values inside, will be the number of times, number of distinct users that actually interact with the item. So how do we derive uh, the co-occurrence matrix um, from the interaction data? Uh, we use three columns, the user item as of the time, and we, we do a self-join by the user. So we get duplicated columns for the, for the item and the time. And then, um, if we take the difference between the time, right, we can get the durations between interaction of, of this, these two items by that user. So we can further down and do some filtering uh, of the of the interaction based on the duration between the interaction. Uh, this is important because if we, we want to consider, we, are, we only want to count uh, interactions that are close together, for example, one week instead of uh, counting interactions that are like months apart. So after we do filtering, we group by item I and J, and then we do account distinct user. Uh, yeah. So what we need to know is that in order to do this, you need to have a very uh, efficient kind of query engine in order to support the large data. Yeah, so how does this actually correspond to the progress matrix? Is that actually the item I, you can think of it as corresponding to the row, item J corresponds to the columns, and then the count will be uh, inside the cell, inside the, the square matrix. Huh? So after we get a co-occurrence matrix, uh, the next step is usually doing some form of matrix factorization uh, as shown here. So an interesting thing to note with regards to matrix factorization, usually we get a latent vector, so latent vectors, there's a compressed form. Uh, you can actually imagine uh, the latent vectors actually is also dividing a form of embeddings uh, for the item. Uh. So for example, if you look at latent Factor U, the item I, item I is actually represented by an embeddings of three dimension. Similarly for uh, item factor B, uh, item J is represented by an embedding of three dimensions. Then we use the embeddings later to calculate the um, similarity. So in terms of matrix factorization, there are a few uh, obvious algorithms that you can use alternating each squares, uh, or we can use stochastic gradient descent uh, if, if memory is a problem. And finally, uh, we can also use the graph model. Graph model is actually, actually represents uh, global vectors uh, for word embedding based on local context, I think. Um, if you look at the paper, you can, you'll see that <coughs> it's actually doing a form of matrix factorization based on co-occurrence matrix. So the concept is very similar. We can apply the same optimization algorithm based on the same laws in the Gerd paper to derive the values uh, for the items. So after we get embeddings to get a similarity matrix, it's very simple, we just do uh, cosine similarity on the embeddings. Uh, this is a very common approach uh, to get similarity from from embeddings. So the whole assumption of this model uh, with regards to calculating item similarity is that uh, we are assuming that items that are similar uh, will be likely to be interacted uh, close together in time by many, many users. So this item similarity matrix uh, can be pre-computed in batch uh, on a schedule. And then already with this other similarity matrix, we can be, we can use that already to serve uh, similarity model, sorry, other similarity recommendations. <coughs> Given item, we, we fetch the scores, and then we just sort by descending order, we can show the items uh, in the other similarity use case. Uh. So next, the uh, family model uh, is also derived from the same transaction data, and then we use data. How do we do that? 
Uh, this step is relatively more straightforward. It's just a bunch of computation. Um, for the user interaction data, we actually calculate two values, uh, applying time decay based on the time of interaction, and then uh, having separate event weight uh, depending on the type of event. So, of course, we want to weigh like event such as purchases at a higher score than an event such as a few. Given these two columns, then we just multiply them together to get a finished score. Uh, so this actually takes into account uh, the, the type as well as the recency of the interaction. And you can see the formula here. Uh, w represents the weight of the event. And then this exponent here uh, is a time decay um, with a certain half-life. So big P is a hyperparameter you have to, you have to uh, define are pretty fine. Uh, depends on what you want to use. I, I think in general, like using 24 hours or seven days, uh, tend to work well. So from this, you actually you will get an identity vector that looks like this. And the assumption here is that users have references based on the item they are they recently interacted with. Um, if you think about it, the item and feedback vector, it is almost uh, just a recommend showing the last few items. So it's not very useful by its own. But uh, the item and feedback vector will be used later to derive the candidate items that we will show to the user. And what's important here is that uh, in order for personalized, personalized recommendation to be able to be done in real time, uh, this item and feedback vector has to be computed in real time. So how do we put together the two models uh, to finally get the personalized recommendation score? Uh, it's actually very straightforward. It's just a linear algebra. Yeah, so given the affinity vector and the similarity model, you do a dot product. You get a set of um, relevancy, user item relevancy score. Then given this score, you just do a sort in descending order, take a dot. 10 to 100, uh, then you can make the recommendations to the user. So the concept is such that um, for each, each item, right, so the user, the item, for each item, uh, it has high scores only if it has very high similarity to many recent items that the user has interacted with. Uh, how do you get that? Is that given this formula? In order for R to be high, um, it has to have high similarity with many items, and then these items, ideally, they are also recently interacted. So the finish score is be high when it's recent. Yeah. And also, it has to be computed in real time, because similarly, an uh, identity vector is computed in real time. So the machine multiplication has to be done in real time and then you get the return scores for the relevancy. So uh, we'll next cover some implementation challenges as well as possible improvements. So I, I've been saying uh, the need for the affinity vector to be calculated every time. This poses actually some very uh, important engineering challenge. Uh, first of all, we need to have accessible live tracking of the user interaction logs. What do I mean by that is that in order for the affinity vector to be computed in real time, first of all, we need to be able to track the user's interaction in real time. That means uh, once a user has clicked on a certain web page, it must be inserted into the database. And not only that, the database must be able to, I mean, must be able to retrieve the information in the database uh, in low latency immediately. So this poses actually a very strong engineering challenge. And then next, uh, of course, the Doing the computation of the linear algebra, we need to have some uh, way to efficiently compute the, the dot product. But this is not really a problem nowadays with very efficient linear algebra libraries. Uh. 